Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We turn now in our hymnal to volume 2, unit 4, an introduction to poetry. I'm with you on page 626 and following. Notice right away and put it in your notes. The big question now shifts to this question. Does all communication serve a positive purpose? We're going to want to ask a question like this as we get into our study of poetics. Now put that term in your notes, poetics. When you're a senior, we'll be working with the great Aristotle in his famous essay called Poetics. We'll actually mention this again when we meet Antigone in the next unit. But poetics for our use here, write it down, simply means the study of poetry, the analytical study of poetry. We begin on page 628 with the elements of poetry, as we have done in our earlier units, one, two, and three. We will now want to make sure that we get some of these in our notes. I'm not gonna read all this material with you, but I want you to at least have some sense of what's there, okay? Elements of poetry. Notice, first of all, poetry combines, I'm reading with you on 628, Poetry combines structural elements with concise musical and emotionally charged language to express multiple layers of meaning. It was the great poet, maybe the greatest poet of the late 20th century, Czesław Misza, the great Polish poet, who said that poetry can do far more than prose can do because it can say things in very limited amount of words and yet somehow affect change, affect some kind of response. We're going to study to see if that is in fact true. Let's look first of all at some of the elements of poetry. Notice we begin with structure and meter. We of course will understand this notion of stanzas just like we did in our freshman year where we will be dividing up a set of lines into a group. Think of it as the equivalent of a paragraph, a stanza. We will of course have meter, I, I hope these are all in your notes, the rhythmic pattern, notice, established by stresses or beats. We have Scanning, that's an important word. We did this when we were freshmen as well. Scanning each line, making each stressed syllable with an accent and each unstressed syllable with a horseshoe symbol, an unstressed sign, okay? And we've got a number of these, beginning, of course, with the iambic foot, ba-bum, ba-bum, begin, ba-bum. And we have the trochet, we have the anapest, we have all of these listed. You want to pay attention to each one of these. Of course, we can have different kinds of meter. And, of course, that iambic foot, ba-bum, can be translated into tetri, tetrameter, right, which contains eight syllables, for example. Or we can do iambic pentameter, a pair of star cross lovers take their life, ba-bum, 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 as we, as we messed around with it before. Hey, this may be a new word for you. I don't know that we spent a lot of time in our freshman year with this word. Do you see it on 628? In Janman, do you see it? To maintain a, merit, uh, uh, a metrical pattern, a poet may carry a thought over from one line to the next. A line is said to be in jam if you have to break the line and then keep reading it, okay? So, for example, notice that in our example here, it's in jamment, lines two and four are in jammed. It is a beauteous evening, calm and free. That's a full thought, do you see it? The holy time is quiet as a nun, breathless with adoration. That's an enjambed line. The broad sun is sinking. Do you see how sun is sinking? Here, can we just say this out loud? It's one of the biggest problems for students reading poetry. Look at that line again with me. I'm on 628, by the way, in that little box. 628 in that little box. Do you see how, if you were to read it this way, the broad sun, and then you were to pause, is sinking down in its tranquility, doesn't, it doesn't make as much sense. When we read an enjambed line, what we do is we keep reading, so we read it again. The broad sun is sinking down in its tranquility, okay? So as we get into some of the poems we're going to study, we want to pay attention to this one, all right? Of course, you can have enjambment and meter, and uh, that is exampled for you there at, on, at the bottom of page 628. Write this one down. We have sound that we want to think about in poetry. We have free verse, which doesn't follow regular me metrical patterns. We have, of course, rhyme and rhyme scheme. That's a big one. Rhyme, the repetition of vowel and consonant sounds. End rhymes, of course, are words that rhyme at the end of lines. We have internal rhymes. We have slant rhymes. I'm hoping that you're understanding as you're reading through all of this. We have rhyme scheme. That is to say, we'll put a little A at the end of the first line, and then at the, sec the last word of the second line rhymes with it, we'll put another A. If not, we'll put a B, etc., etc. By the way, we're going to see all of this exampled in the, in the study, okay? 
Uh, 629, a couplet, put this one in your notes, a pair of rhyming lines, okay? So we're talking about here um, uh, 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 just a two-line set. Shakespeare's sonnets all end with a rhymed couplet. We have some other sound devices as well, alliteration, repetition of initial consonant sounds, assonance, repetition of vowel sounds, consonants, repetition of final consonant sounds, onomatopoeia, the, the, the one that, of course, all elementary children love to smile about that word, right? Um, a word that actually sounds like it. So, for example, huffed or buzz is an onomatopoeic word. On to page 630, determining poetic meaning, right? To fully understand a poem, consider the voice of the speaker. This is huge. Put it in your notes. We don't just assume that the speaker in the poem is the poet. Okay? We don't assume that. We talk about the speaker in the poem, not the poet. All right? And as well, we can have literal and figurative meanings of words, just like we saw in our study of, 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 of fiction as well, right? Voice emerges from a, a poem's speaker. Tone, of course, the attitude projected towards subject and audience. These are all terms we should be now familiar with, right? We have different kinds of poetic language on 630. Denotation, the word's definition. Connotations, applied definition, emotional associations. Sensory details, somehow applying to sight, sound, and the other five senses. Figurative language. Here, notice, hope they're in your notes, similes, metaphors, personifications, hyperbole, all these terms I know you've seen before. We're only reviewing. 631, free verse. We have different forms and types of poetry. Free verse may use rhyme, sound devices, meter, and varied stanzas, but doesn't follow a fixed pattern. That's the key. Okay. Or formal verse, sometimes they'll call it open and closed verse. Cl formal verse it's going, to abolish, it's going to follow established patterns. We think about Shakespeare's sonnets in that light. Different types of poetry. This is huge. Make sure this is in your notes. We have narrative poetry. The epic poem we met, of course, in our freshman year with the Odyssey. The ballad, a shorter poem describing a single event. We have dramatic poetry, which tells a story using characters' own thoughts. We have lyric poetry, which expresses the feelings of a single speaker using melodic language, imagery, rhythm, sound devices to express emotions. We have different kinds of lyric poems. Odes, poems of praise that often exhibit complex metrical patterns. Elegies, poems of loss. Sonnets, of course, our 14-line offering. We have different types. The Petrarchian sonnet has a certain kind of rhyme scheme. The Shakespearean sonnet, we have, we'll study that one as well. The haiku, a form of Japanese poetry that, of course, we're familiar with. And the tanka is a, por a form of Japanese poetry that has five unrhymed lines um, um, consisting of five, seven, five, seven, and seven syllables, okay? Both forms often describe a scene from nature. Let's turn now to 632. And as we've done in our previous units, we're going to now study a poem as a model. But before we do that, your textbook company likes to give you kind of the focus of the study, okay? So we're going to begin with the chart on 632. Notice, first of all, language and tone. You then have sound devices as well provided for you, okay? So we're going to be paying attention to each one of these. Language, figurative language, tone, uh, rhythm and meter, rhyme, other sound devices as well. And so what we'll do as we work here is that we'll make sure that we're paying attention then to the ways in which the poem works. Now, hey, 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 let's say this out loud. This is huge. As we said with our other study, we're not here to try to convince you to like this stuff. No, 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 no. Hey guys, you all have your own stuff on your playlists, and those are songs you like, but you of course can't expect everybody else in the world to like them as well, although you maybe would, can't believe that they wouldn't. You know what I'm saying? We all have particular tastes. So our interests here are not in saying, I need you to like this material, but rather appreciate this material. And what do I mean by that? We want to understand how it works. That's our key. How does it work? Here, our model on page 633, we have an exemplar text. I'm offering you this poem, the uh, Jimmy Santiago Baca text. Let's take a look first about the author and about the text. Jimmy Santiago Baca, born 1952, an American poet of Apache and Chicano descent, orphaned at an early age. He grew up on the streets while serving a prison sentence. Well, I hope you're reading with me on 633. While serving a prison sentence, he taught himself to read and now holds poetry workshops in schools, community centers, housing projects, and prisons throughout the United States. Quite remarkable. 
Let's now take a look at the poem. And as we work through this poem, right, we'll want to pay attention, just as your textbook uh, is, is introducing you, we want to pay attention to the ways the poem works, shall we? Read along with me. Let's see how well you can concentrate, focus, conquer monkey mind. Let's see how well we do. I am offering this poem, the title of the poem. I'm offering this poem to you. Since I have nothing else to give, keep it like a warm coat when winter comes to cover you, or like a pair of thick socks the cold cannot bite through. I love you. I have nothing else to give you. So it's a pot full of yellow corn to warm your belly in winter. It's a scarf for your head to wear over your hair to tie up around your face. I love you. Keep it. Treasure this as you would if you were lost, needing direction in the wilderness. Life becomes when mature. And in the corner of your drawer, tucked away like a cabin or hogan, in dense trees come knocking. And I will answer, give you directions, and let you warm yourself by this fire, rest by this fire, and make you feel safe. I love you. It's all I have to give, and all anyone needs to live. And go on living inside when the world outside no longer cares if you live or die. Remember, I love you. Now, a poem like this works on multiple levels. Notice right away, we have figurative language early on. When winter comes to cover you, or like a pair of thick socks the cold cannot bite through. Comparisons, yes, no doubt. Similes. Um, look at number uh, nine there, the repetition of sound devices. The repetition of I love you keeps the reader focused on the topic of love and the ways in which the poem is an expression of love, yes? Look at number 10, more figurative language. Unlike the opening simile that says what the poem is like, the poet now uses metaphors to say that the poem is a full pot and a scar. Number 11, notice language. Precise nouns paint a vivid picture. A hogan is a traditional Navajo dwelling made of logs and mud, for example, right? Very specific language. And then, of course, at number 12, we have the rhyme, don't we? The exact, and we have slant rhymes in the last stanza, link ideas and create a musicality that reinforces the optimistic tone of the poem. Let's quickly do an annotation, just like we do with annotating our stories, annotating our essays. Now we annotate a poem. At level 2A, jot down what is for you the major theme of this poem? Some will say that it's a love poem, directly, straight, and to the point. Some will say there's something in that opening line and the title. I'm offering this poem to you since I have nothing else to give. The idea that when all else fails, maybe this could be a possible message for you, when all else fails, when your life is going really badly, the only thing maybe you'll ever really have is love. Okay, let's jump to 2B. Obviously, we've got some examples here. What was your favorite simile or metaphor here, right? Notice he opens the poem by saying, I'm offering this poem to you since I have nothing else to give. Keep it. And then the very first simile, like a warm coat when winter comes to cover you. We live in a place where we know all about wretched cold. That is to say, when you have the coat on, you feel so much more protected, yes? Jump to 3A really quickly. What is your favorite text of love? What is your favorite song that reminds you of the power of love, the joy of love? Do you have one song in all the songs on your playlist that speak directly to how incredible the power of love actually is? Of course, poetry often is going to exhibit this notion of the power of love and will certainly, I mean, we messed around with it in our freshman year, of course, in our study of Romeo and Juliet. We'll come back to it as, as well here. We're going to see a number of these poems which treat different elements of love. Finally, at 3B, what is your view of love? Do you think that love is, in fact, the only thing in a world of craziness? Can you remember a time in your life when love got you through? Can you write about that? Or when love was the source of tremendous pain? It is quite remarkable, right, that love can be both the source of tremendous joy and tremendous pain. Well, welcome to our study of poetics, and we'll be on our way then. Yes? Thank you.